Hello and welcome to another episode of The Swish Show. I'm your host, Ryan Tuckwood, and my guest today is a serial entrepreneur, having founded two of Australasia's fastest growing companies, including a fitness franchise that exploded to 35 locations, hear this, within the first six months um, of operations, um, and is currently running the fastest growing digital uh, growth agency, um, having recently won the accolade of 2018 Best Social Media Agency of the Year, um, for Australia and New Zealand within their first 12 months of operation. So uh, scaling at pace um, is something that you do um, off the cuff. Um, he's the go-to business expert when it comes to fast and effective business growth. Um, having invested over $2 million personally in paid advertising and his company now manages millions of dollars a year in advertising spend for his clients in over 30 different industries, collectively generating over $1 billion in yearly sales. Wow. Um, he's a published author, features in over 200 publications and global speaker, loves a glass of red wine and I'm excited to find out a little bit more about you. Uh, Mr. Brett Campbell, welcome to The Swiss Show. Mate, thank you for having me. I just want to ask you a quick question. Can you say The Swiss Show 10 times really fast? The Swiss Show 10 <coughs> times really fast. That was clever. So you're a smart man, that's uh, why we're talking. Thinking on my oh, feet. Uh, mate, yeah, really, um, I wanted to get you on for a while. Um, obviously, um, I've been following you probably for longer than you realize. Um, and that's what I love about the current climate that we've got, the current world that we live in with personal brand. And mm. you, you, you can impact lives without people knowing that you're being impacted um, as well. So, um, so thank you for what you've taught me, which you don't even know that you've taught me. Uh, well, mate, is, it was my pleasure to, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll invoice me later, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah that's uh, right. Um, talk about that. We, we spoke beforehand and um, we spoke about um, a lot of podcasts are very generic. Um, it's what's your story, what's your background, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, don't wa I, wanna, I wanna understand who Brett is and I wanna understand how you got to be where you are today, but um, I also wanna just have a really open conversation and just see where it goes. But just to frame it for people that haven't heard of you before, yeah. um, quick 60 to 90 seconds, just grew up in New Zealand and now you end yep. up on the Gold Coast and you've won all these awards, mate. Just to summarise it all for us. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share the, the earliest story, which is actually my first memory that I can actually recall because I think it's a catalyst to the rest of you know my story, so to speak. It was I was four years old. Actually, I was four years and nine months because I'd only just gone to school, right? So I grew up, I, I was born in Sydney okay. and uh, we lived in a caravan park in Gosford. And I remember I'd, I'd maybe been at school for a couple of weeks. And I was running around outside in my school uniform. I'd gotten home during the you know, 11 a.m. or something it was. And um, I heard my name being yelled out. I was just like, Brett, Brett. And I was like, oh, shit. You know, like I was a bit of a rascal kid. Um, and no. it was my, my mum. Yeah, no, go <laughs> figure. But it was my mum yelling out. Right, my mum yelling out. She's like, um, Brett, Brett. I was better. And I ran into the caravan, put my head through the caravan door. And, and um, I seen my mum standing there and my dad standing there at the time. He'd just gotten back from the pub and he was holding my mum. He was about to throw her through the caravan window and it was my mum screaming out for help to run across the road and get help for her. Wow. So that was sort of a, um, you know, a catalyst to this launch pad of, of Brett Campbell, right? Because it was very quickly after that, my mother, my sister and myself moved to New Zealand um, to my grandparents and we grew up in a very low socioeconomic area mm -hmm. uh, in New Zealand. I'd always had this feeling with inside of me that I was different, you know, and, and when I say different, um, I'd watch the X-Men and I'd be like, oh, like I sort of get it, you yeah. know, because I was different to my friends in the way that I thought about things, right? So call that and the you, you recognize this at uh, like that sort of young age, four or five years old? Or well, a as I was growing up as a young kid, yeah. I, I was recognizing that. Wow. So I didn't at, at five, let's call it as I started to go to school and started to hang out with friends consistently. Yeah. You know, I'd go to friends' houses, stay at their houses, see, you know, see how they did life, see how I did life, see how I thought about it. So I'm, I'm definitely a very deep thinker. Mm. In the last probably three, four years, it's, it's like come out in a really big way in how I look and, and break down certain things in life and business in general, right? Oh, wow. But I knew I was different because I, I wanted more. Like I, I grew up, had this hunger for, I want this, I want that, I want that. And we weren't able to, to get it, right? Because my mother was on a benefit. She was working two jobs, you know, trying to keep a you know, house over our head. Um, and for me, it was this quest of trying to figure out who, who Brett Campbell was. And I think, you know, a lot of males especially, and I know females, but, you know, a lot of males in that sort of growing up phase of trying to figure out who they are, what they're here for, what role do they play, mm. you know, and we, we're, we're trying to figure that out as we're growing up. Um, you know, I was, <clears throat> I was a misguided 
student, you might want to call that. You know, I was, I was a nice, kind, caring person, but I talked too much. Right, I was the kid who was always talking. I was trying to make my friends laugh. I was a class clown. Mm. You know, again, I got kicked out of high school for talking too much, which is funny. Now I make a living from talking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but again, that's another conversation on the school and curriculum and how they might be able to nurture certain people. Yeah. But um, made long story short, kicked out of high school, became a cabinet maker. You know, knew from day one that wasn't the job that I I wanted to do or should have been in. And it got to a point where, you know, things got so internally painful for me that like I was waking up crying going to this job mm. like even though you know I'd reached a level of success with inside that role within that job that most would be you know extremely happy with you know I was the first apprentice to be signed off in the apprenticeship so apprenticeships last for four years yeah 8,000 hours I was the first apprenticeship in the entire apprentice history um, to my knowledge especially in the cabinet maker in our in our factory's 30 year history to be signed off in three years right and there's can talk about why that happened yeah. and it just feeds back into my narrative of I like to do things fast is, is that competitiveness or, or efficiency or? it's a it's it's the ability to and I, I really you know about four or five years ago when I created um, another business called Unleash Your Greatness which took me on this personal development path of really trying to figure out certain things because you know when it, when I was let's call it early 20s at that's when personal development and personal mm. growth and self-improvement became a thing for me. I understood that there was this thing, yeah. right? Um, and for me, it was, I live with the philosophy, if there's, a, if there's a faster way to do it, why would we not do it? You know, life's too short. Yeah. I've got a lot of stuff to do. I've got a lot of boxes to tick. Mm. You know, so if there's a faster way to do something, generally, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'd be the guy that people come to and go, hey, how can we do this faster? Yeah. And not at the detriment to what the outcome is, but finding the shortcuts, finding the, the yeah. solutions to problems. You know, I quickly at an early age adopted this problem solving mentality, which allows me to, one, it's why a lot of problems come to me, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I'm naturally putting it out to the universe. When I realized this, I was like, man, why do a lot of problems come my way? Yeah. It's because you like to solve them and yeah. you solve them fast, so it's, it's just going to give you back more and, of what you And you, you condition want, right? the people around you to say, well, just give it to Brett and he'll figure it out. Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that can be an Achilles heel at time because then yeah. I had to learn how to, you know, not be that person yeah. who's always like, especially with my wife, you know, I learn a lot about that. It's like, <laughs> don't don't note to every male out there, females don't yeah, want yeah. the answers or the solutions to everything, even though they might come to you and go, oh, this yes. isn't working. Yeah, and I'll then you're like, that one. Are you sure you want me to help? Are you actually sure though? Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And even when they say yes, don't. <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. Like, I told you, I was testing you. Okay, oh, I don't know, I'll give up. But um, yeah, it was, it, was uh, um, it got to a point for me internally, I would have been early 20s, I was like, I, I want more from life um, in New Zealand. There wasn't a lot of opportunities. The, the inspiration that I had was my boss, and he had a you know a V8 um, Holden Ute, and he owned the business. Yeah. And he had a farm, and I was like, if that's what the if that's my highest level of success that I could get to, I, I don't want to have a bar of that, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and when I said I don't want a bar of that, I just I was that kid that would always go past the biggest mansions, biggest houses, and you'd see the Lambos and Porsches, and you'd be like, I wanted to go and knock on someone's door and go, what do you do? Yeah, wow. Like, tell me what you do. Like, I'll pick ragwort out of a bush if it's going to make that much money yeah. to do that, yeah. right? So for me, there wasn't really a, this is what I wanted to do. I would have done anything because I had this hunger. It's just, this is what I want to get. This is what I want to get, yeah. yeah. And at the time, when you're younger, it's like things. Yeah. I just wanted things. I just wanted mm. a better way of living. <clears throat> but again, it's that if there's a faster way to get something, but also if there is an opportunity that there is something better, why would you not strive to mm. get that? Right, where a lot of people are, oh, that's just greedy and money hungry and this. And it's like, that's a load of bullshit. Yeah. It's like, then I ask someone who says that, right? Let's just say someone says, oh, but why do you always have to have the best thing? Would you rather fly first class Emirates to Abu Dhabi or, or fly Jetstar in cattle class? Yeah, absolutely. And everyone goes, well, of course, first class. Yeah. Well, when you actually strive for those things, it provides you with the opportunity to have a decision, make a decision. Mm. You don't have to fly first class if your morals still are against that, yeah, yeah. but it, it's about providing there. opportunity, yeah. right? Yeah. So from a very young age, it was, if, if I ever wanted anything, I had to work for it. So that was really instilled within me. Yeah. Um, and that just started the quest of, you know, when I finally had enough, took my golf clubs in one suitcase, jumped on an airplane, moved from New Zealand to Australia, surface paradise here actually, funnily enough, um, and started as a personal trainer. Right, because at school I was good at three things. I was good at woodwork, I was good at PE, and I was good at lunch. Wasn't going to get paid to eat, right? Not going to get paid to eat. 
Um, I'd already tried the woodworking thing as a cabinet maker. I was like, well, physical education, that's sort of where I've got to, yeah. and, and that's sort of where I, my entrepreneurial journey started from, I guess you would say. How, how was that, that, that decision then, after everything that your family's been through, uh, you've already kind of left Sydney, you've gone over to NZ, how do you then leave that behind? Like, is, is your drive and your passion so strong that you're like, I, I, I just have to, because yeah. I've gone through that journey myself. I had to leave everything behind because I knew there was yeah. something more out there for me. Where, where was your, what was your catalyst to, to do it? Um, so there, there's a bit of a gap in between it. So when I, when I left the cabinet making, because again, it was my, when I walked into the cabinet making job when I was 16 years old, the first day I was like, how do I own this factory? That was, that's my yeah, mindset. Wow. I'm unemployable unless you want me to own your business, right? Because right. that's how I look at it. What an attitude people should take when they start a job, right? Well, because yeah. then you're going to figure out everything that you need to figure yeah. out to potentially if you are the owner or not, right? Yeah. And it just so happened that they were grooming me. So, you know, I, sh I showed great skill. Um, you know, I was, I was you know, one of the top in the factory, or second best in the factory. There was this guy, one guy who was way better than me. Got some cool stories around that guy, um, if we dive into them. But, which taught me a lot. Um, but I was, I just, it had that feeling that I was, I don't want to just be someone who turns up mm. and has to drive this car and shit, I'm, I've got $700 a week and this is my cap and yeah. I have to work out my life in between that. I was, I just don't feel that that's, if there's another option, I want to take it. Yeah. So it was the car when I owned the factory and then, you know, I became factory foreman and I started taking on apprentices myself, went in there and then they were sort of grooming me. There was an opportunity to start another business with inside that business and they wanted me to head it up and it sort of fell through and they were grooming me, they were trying to keep me there and, and it got to a point where I was like, I feel like you're dangling the carrot a little bit too much, I'm not committed to wait for another five years yeah. for this. Um, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to fucking university. <laughs> so I literally left, I, I went to university for a year, to, or I was supposed to go for four, um, sure. went and studied Bachelor of Sport and Leisure. Right, so I wanted to go and that was where I was like, well, let's get into the fitness industry, become a sports scientist or a PT yeah. or whatever. Um, that was basically my gap year. You know, I was like a 24-year-old, a 23-year-old mature student, you know, mature yeah, student yeah. going into university as a, a young time. man. Oh, that's amazing, <laughs> yeah. you know, you turn up to uni and you're like, yeah, I've got money. You know, because I had money, I'd already yeah, built my own house. And, yeah, I had a car yeah, yeah. and like, so it was a different, a totally different feeling. But one thing I learned though from that was at the end of the first year of uni, I was like, this is an absolute waste of time. Mm. Like I'm doing, can I swear on this? Yeah. I'm yeah. doing fuck all. I think you have three times. Yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Good, well, at least, well, sorry, mum, I tried it, I'm trying. But like I was doing fuck all. Like I'd go to two classes a day and the, the tutor was so shit anyway that I could literally, we ended up literally going online and just getting the slides because all we did was read the slides. Yeah. Right, so I was like, uni was like a gap year and I was like, I can't, whilst this is great, I can't do this for another three years. Yeah, it's not. It's not right. Yeah. So I literally, um, you know, flew over at the end of the first year of uni. I flew to my sister's in Sydney. I made a deal with her that I'd come over and I'd they'd just put a pool in and I'd build the pool um, fence and the decking and and she lets me stay there for like six weeks of the holiday. And whilst I was over there in Sydney, I did a Google search for personal training courses in the Gold Coast, and something popped up and I was like, oh, I could be a trainer in like you know, twelve weeks online. I'm like. Wait a minute! I could do it. I could do that, and then be training in a gym, when or go back to New Zealand, do another three years, and then hopefully get a job in a gym. I was just like, that that seemed like the it's obvious best choice, right? So I did the course, moved up to the Gold Coast, and um, and then when the funny thing was, my my friends went back to uni for the second year. I was already working in a gym as a PT. I was like, boys, I'm already earning like eighty bucks an hour, and you're like just starting your second year of university. Yeah. Right, so it's an interesting um, thing that the the, the modern academia, um, the university textbook skills that you get, which obviously I went through a um, similar journey, um, becoming an engineer, mm. did that for eight years before actually practiced it for eight years until I went. There has to be more out there for me. Um, so you actually nipped it in the bud a lot earlier than I did. Well, um, only because I learned from the first thing, right? Yeah. Like I should have nipped the apprenticeship in the butt quick. Mm, okay. But the reality at that time was I didn't have the mental awareness or acuity to understand that I could go and do other things. Like again, when I say my town was small, few thousand people, the job that I got, you know, was was a pretty good job in that town, right? Because yeah. there's not a lot of opportunities. You have to travel out, out, of, out of town to get a job. Um, and back in that sort of era, you know, 
apprenticeships were quite a strong thing still, you know, um, and the theory behind the apprenticeship was, and I remember my mum saying this to me, it's ingrained in my head, because literally in the first few days of even being there, I knew it wasn't for me. Like I was getting bullied from my boss, he was calling me all sorts of names, and I was like, wow, I'd never been exposed to this, mm. you know, um, and I just didn't want to, just didn't want to keep going back. And, you know, my mum was like, look, son, stick it out. Because, you know, later on in life, if, if anything doesn't work out, you can always fall back on this trade. And I'm like, whew, okay. And that was the thing that I was like, oh, that I can always use this to fall yeah. back on. For, hand on heart, I'll never build a kitchen cabinet in yeah, my yeah. entire life or build a house or build anything again unless yeah. I want to for fun, not for money. Yeah. But that was my mum's best advice that she gave me with what she had and understood. Yeah. And, and that was sort of the thing around apprenticeship. So... You know, I learned that, um, you know, I've done a lot of dumb things, right, and I've made a lot of silly decisions, but I learned from them. Like, I wasn't going to fall into that trap twice and go, oh, uni sucks, it's a waste of time, but you've got three more years, Brett, and that yeah. piece of paper will be really good with, for you, yeah. you know, so. But it's, um, that's so funny, it must be a mum thing, because my mum said exactly the same thing to me about my, my qualification. I, I, I always felt I was born in the wrong country. Um, I, I love the sun, chase the sun, worked in Greece when I was 18 for six months. Um, I, getting on a plane when you finish a summer holiday, my arms are like out the door as I were, we're boarding the plane, getting the last few seconds of sunshine, right? So I'm like, Australia was always on my radar, but it was get your, get your, um, your engineering qualification. You can always fall back on it, but exactly the same. I'll never go back into it, but it is still there. It's a safety yeah. net, right? And look, there, we, I mean, I'm a massive believer that everything happened the way it was supposed to happen because it did, yeah. and everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen right now because it is, right? Those are two fundamental core yeah. beliefs that I hold, like, deeply um, ingrained in me. Like like someone would believe in a religion, I believe in that, that yeah. which, which allows me to be able to get through, I call it my acceptance strategy, it's how I get through things, it's how I overcome any adversity or any mm. problem or any frustration or any concerns that I'm having because there's no other way to unreconcile that. It happened because it did happen. Yeah. What are you going to do? So is it, is it that, uh, I think it was Grant Cardone I first heard say this, that it, that it happens for you. Um, so everything happens for you. No. Yeah, I think Tony Robbins uh, was from my... Uh, I heard him say that maybe 12 years ago, everything happens for you, not yeah. to you. Yeah. Right, which again is another way of framing it. Yeah. It's, it's, I think, having those, um, whatever the phrasing is for whomever, I think having those core stables and belief patterns is an absolutely empowering thing, mm. right? It, it's that everything happened the way it was exactly supposed to happen because it did happen yeah. and there's nothing you can do about it. So why would we even spend an inkling of a second worrying about it? Yeah, It's already been, Yeah, right? Um, and for me, it's having those belief patterns allow me like I say to be able to really work through things a lot faster because again the question always is okay Brett how do you do things so fast mm. it's strategy right there's a strategy for everything a strategy on how you look at something I spent half an hour the other day on a podcast talking about ping pong <laughs> right like talking about ping pong and how I you know Daniel you know my business partner who he was number one on the table I couldn't beat him like he was the only person I couldn't beat and I was like far out this is crazy like I want to I wanna be able to beat him. Not just so I can go, yeah, I bet you. But I love it when people are better than me because it elevates me you to become better right. and figure out yeah. things, right? Um, like, you know, without being egoic, but as I was growing up as a kid, I was, you know, better than my friends at a lot of things, especially when it comes to sport-related, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there wasn't as much <coughs> challenge that I had to really put in. It was just sort of I'd always use my natural ability just enough yeah. Right. And I, I noticed that when I actually went back through and I, because I, I played rugby growing up and I was the first five and so I was the kicker. It didn't matter if I kicked from 20 metres in front of the post or from halfway, I'd always just get it over the post. Yeah, okay. Right. Which was an interesting thing for me because yeah, yeah. I was like, it was always just enough. Yeah. There's no point putting in unlimited energy right in front of the post and kicking it out of the stadium. So it was this natural pattern that I went through life doing. It was just enough, just enough. Yeah. So when some, when I and got exposed, I guess to the to the entrepreneurial world in a, in a tiny market of people and, and individuals, it really leveled me up as well, Percy. Because I was like, oh, now I've got to play a better game, mm. right? And we noticed that when we went and played other schools, I was like, oh, these guys are way better than us. Yeah. Like I might be like the fourth best here, 
and you know I might have been the best at my school, but I was maybe fourth or tenth even at that school. And I'm like, oof, right? So it's the exposure again. Exposure is, is very very valuable. How, how on that note then? Because there, there's definitely be people that will be listening, um, saying when I get put into a different arena um, around other people that are maybe where I want to be or a little bit further ahead in their journey. How does that not push you into your shell and go, well, I can never achieve that? I mean, it sounds like for you it's natural, but yeah. is, there, is there something that you can switch on to go, no, I can, I can achieve whatever I want? Like, how, how can we help yeah. people that maybe think the other way? Yeah, so it's a good question because I'm constantly challenging certain belief patterns and certain things that are being said. And one of them, this popped up probably about six months ago, I had a pretty big conversation with the person around it because they're like, oh, you can do anything you put your mind to. I said, no, you can't. Okay. I said you can't. I don't believe that. You can do anything that you can do. All right. So I rephrased it like that. And she's like, but if you put your mind to it, anyone can do anything. I said, well, look, I want to be an NBA superstar, but there's zero chance that's going to happen. Yeah. Like really, I'm physically, biologically not made for that. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'd like to be a, a gold medalist swimmer. I don't have size 30 feet yeah. like Ian Phelps. Yeah. Right. So there's just some things that you can't do. So why would you put that misguided belief pattern mm. into someone's head? Right, because it's false. It's not true. Yeah. No one can do whatever they put their mind to. And everyone's out there spruiking it. I mean, heck, yeah, I spruiked yeah. it too. Yeah. If, until I seen a different way of yeah. looking. I was like, like I'm feeding this, this beast of false falsehood, yeah, right? Because yeah. it is. I don't believe anyone who puts their mind to something can do anything. Yeah. You can do what you can do. Yeah. Let's be real about it. Yeah, I, like I think it. I actually... I. I uncovered this way of thinking after listening to Jordan Peterson. I was about to reference right? him, yeah. Because I've learned so much indirectly from that guy. It's fucking unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I think I've shared the videos with you. And I've got so many people on the, the JP train purely from a different way of looking at it and a realistic way. Yeah. And removing the fluff. Right, removing and the stuff that we're being a realist is, it isn't negative, right? It's, no, it's, it's just being real. Yeah, yeah. And it's like we don't need to sugarcoat it. Yeah. If you're telling your kid that you can grow up and do anything you want, you're fucking feeding them with absolute lies. Yeah. I want to be a, on a, a singer on America on Australian Idol. Well, sorry, Johnny, you can't sing to save yourself. Yeah, Simon Cow comes along. Right, like, right. And then yeah. Simon Cow comes along yeah. and chops the kid's head off because he's like, ah, oh, that. Who told you to do that? My daddy, your yeah. mum. It's like, oh gosh. Yeah. Like, let's sort it out earlier. You know, before it becomes a thing. Yeah. So um, you reference um, Jordan Peterson, but then just before that, you, you mentioned um, Tony Robbins. So you're obviously yeah. in and around the entrepreneurial world. You're one of the vision partners um, at the Entourage, uh, yeah. um, fantastic organisation. Yeah. Um, how how did that happen to you? Where where did where was the crossover into personal development? Because for me, I didn't invest in personal development until 29 years old. Yeah. Um, and I'm 30 37 now. Yeah. Um, and it just wasn't. I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. So where where was your first? Well, it was when I. Literally back to the, I had my golf clubs in one hand, suitcase in another, and I moved to Service Paradise, and I started as a personal trainer. I went to um, a an event with two guys who um, were coaching coaches for personal trainers, so teach you how to build a fitness business, right? And um, and those guys are really dear friends of mine right now. Um, you know, we've created an amazing relationship, and. One of them was into personal development um, in, in another business, and it was sort of where I got my first little glimpse into um, you know, meditation and thinking differently. And because I'm such a curious person, like for me, it, it was like um, I akin it to when you've, you've been, you, you know you've been searching for this thing forever, but you didn't really know, but as soon as you see it, you're like, oh my, it's, it's like love at first sight, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I was love at first sight, because I was like, this is so good, this is what I've been searching for. Because yeah. these, these are the sort of conversations I've been trying to have in my own head, but I didn't even really realize, right? And then you obviously, you hear someone talk about, oh, listen to Tony Robbins, or you know, Go and read this book, and you read, and it's just different ways of thinking and mm. looking at life. And I'm like, oh my god! And I just went down rabbit hole after rabbit me. hole of rabbit hole. Yeah. yeah. Well, the the biggest thing for me, one of the biggest first pieces of let's call it information or knowledge that I took in that acted upon was when I read the E Myth. Yeah. Right. Like so whatever, I didn't. Yeah. I went through high school, didn't read a book. I was second in English. I didn't read one book. My book studies was, and what I didn't realize at the time, I was speed reading. Now it's a 
I teach this speed reading formula based off how I actually skimmed through books at school. Didn't realise I was doing it yeah. to, to, you know, to pass subjects. But you know, I'd be looking at the title page, looking for key things. I'd be scrolling through, and I'd be looking at the contents page. Oh, the, on the back, they pretty much sum up the whole book anyway, yeah. right? Um, you just need to pull the pieces together. I was pretty good at problem solving, so I was like, oh yeah, that probably happens here, then this and that might happen. And you know, I'd, I'd get you way more right than yeah, wrong, yeah. right? Um, and I'd save time. But the first book I, I picked up, it was The E-Myth, and I was on a train from Sydney City down to Wollongong to where my sister was, right, which is about a two-hour train ride. And I open this book, and I'm just reading it, and then I get a phone call from my sister. She goes, oh, hey, how far away are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm uh, at, I can't remember what place it was. I said, oh, I'm here. She goes, that's an hour past our stop. And she's like, you need to hop off, get on another train and come out. I'm like, oh, my God, I would literally had 10 pages left of the book. Wow. Like I'd consumed this whole book and did not put it down because it was like it was speaking to yeah, me viscerally, yeah. you know. And funnily enough, I went on and built a franchise because that was it was all talking about franchising, yeah, yeah. right? Whether that was directly from the book or it sort of just fell fell into place. But it was I realised that there's that entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. Because mm. when I was a cabinet maker, I was really good at the technician work. You know, I was one of the the best cabinet makers in the factory when it comes to detail and you know um, building things. Uh, but I liked managing people as well because I was like I'd, I'd rather actually not have to do the work I'd yeah. rather sort of delegate I like that too yeah. and then that whole entrepreneur I never had a real whiff of it that was the you can own this business yeah. Brett, and then you can you know make the decisions I that was where I was like now I need to create that for myself okay so that's, that's a really good point because right. when I read that book I, I was exactly the same I'm a phenomenal technician I'm yeah. a great employee um, you employ me I'll be the first one in last one out never have a sick day you're hired and I'll, Let's yeah, go. I'll just I'll just do whatever <laughs> you tell me to do and I'll follow systems well because I'm an engineer yeah um, but I also like leading and, and and I get more of a buzz these days hence why we created the sales training company mm. in coaching other people to become the best version that they can be but then I got introduced to the entrepreneurial world I started working obviously with the co-founder Jack and he had that more more of a natural ability to see three years ahead um, mm -hmm. to see the bigger picture um, so I think I've grown into that. Um, but what's your belief there? Is it is it was it always in me, and was it always in you, and you just had to uh, join the dots, or or do you think you've created it as you as you touched? I mean, you can look at it in two ways. One, everything is always in everyone, <coughs> right? It's just a matter of are you going to get to that point. You can do what you right? can do. Ex absolutely, yeah. yeah. You, you can do anything that yeah. you can do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, for me, I knew, like it was like almost, I had an alien inside of me that needed to come out. Right, and that was my entire life. I'd felt that. I think there's levels of entrepreneurship. I've been talking about this quite a bit lately as well, and I think it's a conversation that the business world, entrepreneurial world, need to hear about and be and start having the conversation around. Is I think there's too many people that are calling themselves entrepreneurs and they're not. Yeah, they're not. Right. Um, just because you have a business or you have a PTY LTD and you got you and two staff or three staff, even ten staff, it doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right, um, so there's layers to it all, and what I mean by that is, um, entrepreneurs. I, I feel right again when I talk about layers, is the entrepreneur does not get stuck in the day-to-day -day running of a business. That's not the role of an mm. entrepreneur, right? I know when you're a founder, right? Like I have been many times. You do get stuck because it's starting you. It's you, you, you. But your first goal from day one needs to be how do you remove yourself? Yeah where what happens is so many people, business owners, entrepreneurs, they get stuck in the grind of it, right? And I'm, we've got obviously a digital growth agency and I spend a lot of my time talking to business owners and they come to me going, hey, what should we do for our marketing? Or how do I do this? Or how can I do this? I'm like, you shouldn't. You should be finding someone else who can do it for you. Mm. That's what an entrepreneur does. Are you an entrepreneur? Yeah. Okay. What is Are you thinking like an entrepreneur? Are you building a business like an entrepreneur? What does your business look like in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months? Oh, I want to do to be this big, da, 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 da. I'm like, well, decisions you make right now are going to affect that. And you know if you're the person sitting there in your ad account trying to create ads, or you're the person on the phone stuck doing sales calls, you're not going to grow your business. That's not what an entrepreneur does. They do it when they have to do it, yeah. but it can't be the... You, you can you always have to put interim in front of what you're doing. Yeah. On the interim sales yeah, okay, leader, yeah. on the interim marketing person. Because I get it, we have to do certain yeah. things. You know, when we first started the company, I was doing everything. Right? I've got the unfair advantage in our business, I think, of having every role pretty much. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Um, but I feel once people find the, the place that they stay in or they should be in, the lane that they should be in, you'll find that there's not a lot of entrepreneurs compared to what there really is perception-wise. Yeah, Because right? yeah. some people are just better business partners. Mm. You know, like you, could, you might be the best business partner. Yeah. But might not be the best person who's going to go out there and risk it all and start a brand new venture and go, follow me, guys, because I know. Yeah. Which either right? way is fine, right? Either way is fine. Yeah, yeah there's no right or wrong yeah. here. Yeah. I think it's finding who you are and what you are and then synergizing with someone else or yourself and building the team around that. Yeah, be the Wozniaki. <laughs> well, that's right. Be, you, you can look at it and you go, well, do you want to be the Richard Branson? Yeah. Yep, I'd like, and again, it's hard to talk about these type of guys because they're so far down the line of, of business. Yeah. But the extreme ends of it is, you know, what type of entrepreneur do you want to be like? Mm. Do you want to be a Richard Branson? Do you want to be an Elon Musk? Right? Do you want to be a, a Tony Robbins? Very different mm. levels of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Tony's in it all day. He's, he's called to do the work. Richard Branson, I'm not sure what he does on a day-to-day, yeah. but I can't assume it being too boring. It'd be quite fun. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he basically says, like, if you do you know the story of Virgin Galactic? Uh, How it started? No, I don't think so. Okay, so this just shows you the insight. And when I hear stories like this, I'm like, yes, that's the type of entrepreneur I am and want to be more of. So there was a, a company called um, XPRIZE, okay, so founded by Peter Diamandes. Um, he wrote the book Bold. Good book, actually. You should check it out. And Abundance. The book Abundance. He's, he's like the probably foremost person who's up to date with all the latest new technologies, innovations from health all the way through technology, AI, etc. Right? He created a company called XPRIZE and the purpose of that company is to create and solve world's biggest problems. And they sort of outsource it to, they put a tender out to the world and go, okay guys, here's, here's a problem, we need to solve it. There's a monetary prize for the person or team that can do it. Right. In this case, Virgin Galactic was, we want to create a, um, we want to create a company that can take, you know, people, consumers into space, back out of space and back and land, right, as a as a commercial entity, yeah. um, and they had over a hundred teams compete for this thing, right? The prize was ten million dollars. That was it. The prize was ten million dollars. They collectively spent, I think it was like hundreds of millions of dollars. These teams to try and create what this thing was. Um, it was sort of just the ignition needed, right? And um, they went to Richard Branson and said, hey, um, would you be willing to give up um, the $10 million as the prize for this? And he's like, no. Nope. He said, no. So, okay. They asked him another time a few months down the track again, going, hey, we're about to do this. So you, you don't want to do the, you know, can you give us the prize money type thing? Um, he's like, no. Nope. And then um, the an Ansari family. So it was a wealthy family, yeah. they put up the money, it's called the Ansari X Prize, right? Long story short, um, took a couple of years to, to go through all the iterations and dwindle it down to the certain companies left and, and this one company won. Soon as that space flight happened and they come back, Richard Branson comes out and goes, I'd like to buy the rights, it's called Virgin Galactic. That's how you create a fucking space company, yeah, well. right? Now you look at that and you go, you, you probably were thinking when I said, oh, they went to Richard Branson to give the money, he said yes. Yeah. Right? Nah. Like, when I heard that, I was like, he said no. Well, yeah, oh, my yeah. God, what a gangster. Like, he's, <laughs> yeah. not, he's not doing that. But Has Richard Branson ever been called a gangster before? I don't know. He is now. now. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, it, but it's, it's uh, when you look at it and you break down his way of thinking, like, even everything he does is risk versus reward ratio, mm. right? He was always willing to put the money up if it was a potential success, yeah. right? Because they've now put in hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars. Um, yeah, even with Boeing, he made a deal for Virgin was you can take the planes back. If, it do- if this doesn't work out, I can send the planes back yeah. to you. You know, So um, that type of entrepreneur is the one that excites me the most, mm. right? Like you get a, 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 a Elon Musk, he's very hyper involved and stuff because that's his, his you know, te- technician mind yeah. coming out. Um, you know, the analytical space he likes to be involved in. He's from another planet, to yeah. be honest, right? No, I mean, what he can do. But again, everyone has people around them that yeah. help support that. But I, my main point that I make there is there's different levels of entrepreneurs and you need to uncover which one you are. Yeah. I'm not an entrepreneur that should be stuck in the business day to day. 
like I'll go stir you're, crazy. You, you, your title is the evangelist. You call yourself, right? Yeah, so chief of, co-founder, chief evangelist. Yeah, that's a pr and you know, there's for me, it's being able to operate in the area that I'm the best at being able to operate in that will have the greatest impact for the business. Yeah. Right. So having conversations like this. Yeah. You know, creating our own podcast, creating our own shows doing what I love the most, the things that I, you know, I get to wake up and go, what a cool day today, I'm going to come and have an interview with you, yeah. and then I've got another interview a bit later on, but, you but, know, and, that, and, that and, just, and helping build and grow the vision of the business and yeah. so forth, but from a place that I'm best at. Because a lot of people will look at that and go, well, that sounds all well and good because of what you've achieved, and you're, you get to go and do podcasts and, and have yeah. a coffee, but you've already put the work in, right? But you've yeah, I've seen hundreds of interviews, I've, yeah. I've ran millions of dollars of advertising myself as a technician yeah. you know so I've, I've i've made sales call after sales call after sales call yeah you know um and i mean i'm not in the promised land right now but <coughs> but I've, I've put myself into a really nice situation yeah you know that benefits me because i know when i'm operating at this level right when i'm not stuck in the day-to-day -day, and when i say stuck i use the word sparingly yeah when i'm not involved in the you know in the day-to-day -day, I can get so much more done and do so much more that's going to help the business, right? The chief evangelist essentially is my role is to make sure everyone knows who we are get and what attention. we're about and yeah. get attention yeah. and go, hey, this is why we're the best, this is why you should look at us and you know, hopefully have a gravitational pull of, of people come in and, and, and it happens at this, yeah. you know, where a lot of people go, oh, you, you're sitting there for an hour, it's taken, you know. I had to drive two minutes down the road, <laughs> which was nice. Yeah. Only it's about six hundred meters. I did drive because it's raining. Um, <laughs> I have to put that out there. Um, but a lot of people can see that as a waste of time in a business. Yes. But think about this, right? Who, who sees it as a waste of time? Employees? Other other people around you? Uh, potentially, or people who aren't focusing on bigger picture business. Yes. Right. I look at business in the short term and also the long term. Okay. Another reason why I'm able to get things done fast is because I've already fucking laid the foundation for it. I've already yeah. laid the platform. Yeah. We built our fitness franchise super fast because I'd already had a network of personal trainers that I've been growing for 18 months prior. Yeah. I grew that network with a thought that one day I might do something. Mm. I might coach them or I might mentor them. I had no idea I was going to do a franchise, yeah. but I'd already started. Yeah. I literally had, <laughs> and this will give you an insight into it, right? Um, because it's not just idea let's go now and it's going to be successful it's the what were the prerequisites that enabled you to get to mm. where you were starting to launch something yeah right so i'd started a fitness professional podcast right so we built a arguably fastest growing fitness company at this time in the country online products tens of thousands of products we were selling you know virtual products we we're doing um you know we started fitness retreats um we had a supplement range you name it we had a fitness college it was all happening, right? Yeah. Um, but that was all predicated on all the things I was doing, like eighteen months, six, you know, yeah. twelve months, two years, sort of prior, yeah. right? So I knew that I was always wanting to be a teacher. I love teaching. I love sharing, right? I love sharing, um, and a lot of personal trainers were asking me as we were getting success in the business, going, "How are you doing it? How are you doing?" I was like, "Mate, like, you know, I'll just start a podcast because one day." I might be able to teach them and I'll build a database because that's how we were able to build a successful business, right? This is the best hands down piece of advice ever is build a database. Mm. We had hundreds of thousands of females around the country on our database, mm. hundreds of thousands. Well, and at that time was it was this? sort of like a, that was starting back in 2010. Because that, yeah, that would be you know, early podcast, nine, people 10. weren't podcasting. No, really. no, not really, yeah. no. So I started the Fitness Professional Podcast. That podcast still gets about 600 downloads a month Think about this, right? 600 downloads a month I haven't recorded in like three and a half years. Wow. <laughs> Legacy I'm, material, right? I'm like, yeah. wow. But it was. It was like, okay, we just ran a fitness retreat. We sold out the retreat, and this is marketing hook. We sold the retreat out within 24 hours. We actually sold two back-to-back -back retreats out in 24 hours. But for, for a training, you're like, oh, my God, I want to run a fitness retreat. How would you sell it out in 24 hours? I had a database, right? Yeah. How did we do a $100,000 product launch to sell a $47 ebook? We had a database, yeah. like right, but how'd you get the database? What'd you do prior to that? How'd you get that ready for this? Mm. Where a lot of people are looking at the, and I understand, because I understand marketing, I understand positioning and hooks yeah. and getting people interested into the story, right? But for me with the personal trainer was, I was like, okay, let's, um, let's start a fitness professional podcast. 
where I'll just share how we're doing everything, how I create online products, how I create a fitness business, how I hire apprentices, how I build a group training business. Literally, right now even, you could go back and I'd say the advice is still 95% spot on yeah. with it, right? Um, and I put out like, I think we ended up doing about 60 something episodes. You know, I, I interviewed other fitness experts at the time, right, that I knew, you know, that were sort of positioned in the marketplaces, you know, as experts in the mm -hmm. space. Um, and even to the point where I was like, you know what? Um, so we got online leads, so we had ads running through Facebook. I even engaged a telemarketing company to actually call personal trainers, right? Let's go through every personal trainer in the country, right? I at least want a yes or a no that they want my podcast. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, rang up with, a, with an offer, you know, Brett Campbell, Director of Fit International, Fit Checks, and most people at that time were like, oh, yeah, I know that, mm -hmm. right? Because we were getting a lot of um, play in the market. Um, let's put together a fitness, uh, fitness professional podcast, an audio with over, you know, at the time it was like 20 hours worth of knowledge on how he's built this, 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 and this. Would you like to subscribe to it? Yeah, cool. Okay, what's your email? Bang, done. Next call. Bang, 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 bang. Yeah, wow. Right? So that was my commitment before I even had anything to sell. Yeah. Right? I paid money to a telemarketing company to do that. And the reason why I did a telemarketing company because I wanted to see what the difference of telemarketing versus online lead gen was as mm. well. And to be perfectly honest, it was pretty close really? from, yeah. the ex from the uptake of the conversation. And when I looked at and went back through the data and go, who was a telemarketer lead versus a Facebook yeah. lead? The value, again, of a telemarketer lead, pre-positioned, exposed, etc. Um, it worked out fairly closely, right? Um, so that, again, is that I was laying the seeds for future opportunity. Yeah. When we started Claxon, which was formerly Campbell Media Group, we didn't even do any marketing. I was like, hey guys, we've right. opened the doors. Oh, yeah. cool, I've been waiting for you to do it for yeah. us, right? But, but there's, a, there's a big lesson in there though, isn't there, around commercialize yourself first, monetize yourself second, and, and but, but do it with value. So you, a lot of people say to us, you give away so much content, so much free content, the reality is, but like, ninety-nine percent of people aren't going to use it, right? So, Absolutely. So, so you, um, the personal brand that you put out there, the, all the collateral that you put out there, it's you almost give everything. You, mm. you tell them what to do, um, mm. but most people won't do it, and then they pay for the, the yep. implementation. Is that yep. something? Well, I'll just pay to hear you say it again to them personally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if that's what it takes. I get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very similar. I'm the guy that will go and pay 30, 40 grand for your highest level coaching just so I can ask you the question and get the direct answer from the horse's mouth versus going to buy a product and go through it. Like, yeah. that's just how I am. But again, everyone's different. Know what lane you're in and know how you operate yeah. and then you understand why you do things. And you understand that maybe you should never buy a course in your life ever again. Yeah. Because you're not someone who, who is good at consuming courses. Yeah. You need to invest higher and go direct to the source or you need to, like, yeah. again, that's a strategy. Yeah. Right. Everything in life is a strategy. We're playing a big board game. Figure out the strategy on how to corrupt the bank and monopoly. Yeah. How do I own every house on this fucking board? That's how I start playing. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, how do I own every house? Well, first of all, you got to buy everything. Every time, if you play monopoly with me, you just get pissed off. Everything I land on, I buy. <laughs> buying, buying, buying. I don't care if it's Mayfair or the bloody shitty brown units in the corner. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I will buy everything. Yeah. And I'll not stop buying. That's called Monopoly. <laughs> well, that's right. But there's yeah. people who try and play a deeper strategic game. Yeah, yeah. It's like, all right. Yeah. As soon as I get a hotel, I'm putting a hotel on it. All right. I'll make deals in between the game. Like, I'll buy this off you for more. But, but like, again, it's strategy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, <laughs> you can't sell a secret, right? So the, the, the key is the, the, the database. Um, if you're focusing on and you're playing small and you're just doing one-on-one -on -one outreach. Um, Absolutely. You're playing too yeah. small a game. You, you're similar to as you do um, or pre-COVID you did tours and you did events and you speak from stages all around the world. Um, qu quickly touching on that, do you, do you think that's going to come back? Is it going to be as, yeah. do you think it will be as it'll, prominent? It'll definitely come back. It'll, it'll become probably more VIP-like where mm. I think what a lot of businesses could do and probably should do um, is they'll use these online events as sort of feeders into a a face-to-face -face event and a lot more face-to-face -face events will become paid yeah okay. I, I believe yeah. unless it's sort of like a mega you know um, you know success resource event yeah. you know I mean I'm good mates with Michael and and I love talking to him about you know ways and how to how are they going to come back and what are they going to do you know I mean they're, they're used to putting 5,000 people in a room yeah I know, right yeah, and but but I don't think we're gone through 
that big a change where it's going to change for the rest of the world yeah. you know, right now. I think there's a it's probably about three, four more years before that happens. Yeah. You know, and that'll be the introduction of AI and and um, it's happening. You know, the, yeah, it, it's certainly happening. Yeah. Absolutely, but it'll never go away. Mm. Right. I will still, while well, as long as I'm alive and still sort of hungry for knowledge, I'll still rather go and sit in a in a room with someone talking to them mm. face to face in person yeah you know um, and I don't think you know six months 12 months of COVID is going to rewire everyone's way of mm. doing certain things yeah. right but it can reposition for it can sure. reposition yeah um, so I definitely think the event space is still 100% there and there's no better way to sell um, and to be able to create a lasting um, Outcome or response from some of them being face to face. Yeah, with that. Like, don't get me wrong. Tony Robbins, twenty five thousand or twenty three thousand person UPW he just did with all the Zoom it's cameras. Pretty impressive. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. But nowhere near as, as amazing as it would have been for mm. the, sh the audience if they were actually in a stadium with twenty five thousand people. Yeah, yeah, for like, sure. Like, dude. Yeah. You know, it would be next level. Which is which is quite ironic because you um, you're, you're a digital growth agency, uh, right? So you uh, you focus on impacting people digitally, mm -hmm. uh, but then you obviously hold physical events as well. Firstly, what the hell is a digital growth agency? What does that even mean? Yeah, good. So um, <laughs> it was actually inspired from the book Play Bigger, right? Where they, they actually talk about this concept called Category Kings, and it's about you know can you be the ca the king within the category, right? So you know, Facebook is the category king in social networks, mm. right? Um, Salesforce is the category king in, you know, um, CRM. corporate CRMs, yeah. right? So you know the kings, you know. Um, ClickFunnels is the, the category king in, you know, drag and drop funnel mm. builders. You know, we were, we're in an industry right now that is so fresh and still so new, right? Call it whatever you want, you can call it. Um, digital marketing agency, Facebook advertising agency, you know, advertising agency, media agency. There's so many different terms that you could attach to something and you still don't know what it really mm. even is, right? So we, we sat down and, and we really, when we rebranded from Campbell Media Group to Claxon, we put some intention around what do we want to, what lane do we want to carve out? And we want to call ourselves a digital growth agency, and there's reasons why. Because we are different. We're not a Facebook advertising agency, right? I like to say we don't build ads, we build businesses, okay? And that's a very, very important mm. distinction. Because what that means is we look at customers, businesses, as if how are we going to grow the business, not yeah. how are we just going to get some ads and hit some KPIs for you, Sure. right? Yeah. We, in most cases, going back to our clients going hey we need some more budget we want to scale because we're hitting this 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 means this much revenue are you good with that yep let's go and we're essentially driving a lot of their business growth right so we're a growth agency to start with right where you could go oh, but shouldn't all Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest like because we're again we're over the entire social suite as well in Google and programmatic um, it, it almost epitomizes your personality though right it's like you want to grow fast yeah. So if you're going to put your name to a business and you're working alongside our business, I want you to grow fast as well because it's representative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I always say you'll never outgrow us. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, like and that's that's a, that's a really important pillar as well if someone's looking yeah. for an agency. Don't go to Bob who's working out of his fucking bedroom. He's got two and a half clients right now and you want Bob to run your ads and then all of a sudden Bob's the reason you're not growing because Bob's capacity is only X. Yeah. Right? You need, to, you need to attach yourself with... A business that can actually grow and scale with yeah. you, right? But to, back to the point of a digital growth agency, was we are obsessed about growth, right? Instead of me having to go out and build two hundred companies, we can I can get my fix right now through other companies that we're attached with, mm. growing them, yeah. right? In a specific area, and we don't have to do the fulfillment, all of that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so it was really important for us to one create our own category. Because you'll start hearing people calling themselves digital growth agency, trust me. Yeah. It'll happen. In the next 12 months, especially with what I'm about to do over the next 12 months, you're going to hear it. It's, it's going to become synonymous with agencies. It won't be digital marketing anymore. It'll be digital growth agencies because it's I'm out there changing the perception of business owners' minds of actually growing a business. It's classic my, feature benefit, right? You're not a digital agency. You're, the, the growth is the benefit, so you're selling it in the title. Well, absolutely, yeah. right? That's marketing 101. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, you know, we, we eat our own pie. Um, 
so with that there, there is branding and positioning within it it allows us to be able to have that conversation that's not the same as a Facebook advertising agency right or a digital marketing agency where digital growth is what digital growth means right we're committed to growing and scaling your um, profit through digital channels right we don't mess around with organic and, and all of that stuff because it's for us there's no ROI in it um, and you're better off hiring Mary to sit at in the office with you guys to do it yeah right she'll get more enjoyment out of it um, you know you'll have a direct connection there yeah. but we want to operate in the areas that we know we can have impact and fast impact as well yeah so that's where digital growth comes from yeah amazing um, what I've realized we're about an hour in um, oh, really? and I've barely Look touched um, I've barely touched anything that I had written down here which is always a good sign yeah. um, but where um, where, where are we going in the digital age then? Um, if we're not utilizing agencies or, or not utilizing all these channels, uh, is, are we 100% just missing a trick? Are we totally naive? Um, or is that a really obvious question? What do you mean in, in regards to the the people sh businesses shifting online? Yeah, like, do we have yeah. to take everything digital? Do we have no, we, we don't and we won't, but a lot more will become digital. Yeah. Right, a lot more will become digital. Um, I mean, you, you know this just as well as I do, and especially in what the governments are trying to do from a, you know, um, educational perspective. And and I think there's massive validity in it with online, yeah. um, but nothing will remove the being able to walk into a certain shop and mm. touch something. Yeah. Right. But what it will do, I feel, is that it's going to um, price out a lot of industries, meaning. You know, you look at e-commerce, right? I mean, Amazon two days ago increased um, $13 billion day, increase. No, that was just Jeff Bezos' yeah. thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it went up like a certain certain number of percent or whatever. And his, val his own personal wealth increased $13 billion in a day. Um, hear all the online haters talk about that. Uh, like, yeah, sorry. Firstly, fuck you. Yeah. You know, he's built this business that serves hundreds of millions of people. He deserves the money. And what he decides to do with it is his own thing. And we all right. order from it, and then we complain that he treats his staff Exactly. <laughs> I mean, he has created something that you can purchase pretty much anything you want, and it's here within a couple of days. Think about that. Right? I mean, you owe a lot to him. Yeah. Right? Yes. Do I believe that he should maybe give away a lot more money to... Yeah, there's probability in that, right? But do I know what he does with all his money? I mean, no, but there's, yeah. those are just people out online just being... Um, absolute tool bags um, but I believe what's going to happen from an online perspective is that lower cost products are going to be transitioned online you know mm. um, because it's just going to be easier quick and easy yeah right um, De define lower cost do you think that, is there a sweet spot where once we get to a thousand two thousand ten thousand that, that it stops working well I think even less like a re yeah definitely around less than that if we're talking retail right you know most shops I would assume over time, you know, the, you're not going to sell Louis Vuitton and Gucci and all that. On, there needs to be those sort of shops you go into, experiential, yeah. right? Yeah. Unless your product can be experiential, there's a high chance it'll probably be moved into the online world, mm. right? And a lot of things don't need to be experiential. It's actually probably more convenient to get it online, yeah. right? Um, so there, there's a few... It's going to be very interesting as, as it unfolds. What I can tell you, though, is businesses are starting to... In, and especially post COVID, starting to realise the value of, of online digital and, and, and advertising and not just being now we're not living in a one world approach where we can't just be you're just on Facebook running ads. Yeah. Right. It's an omni channel approach. It's the yeah. ability to use Google, Facebook, Pinterest, Snapchat. And that's why the one man agencies out there aren't going to be successful. Um, at helping businesses grow and scale. You got your they could be successful at running some Facebook ads for Bob's cleaning shop. Yeah. But if Bob's cleaning shop's goal is to actually grow and have 20 Bob's cleaning shops, then Bob needs a marketing strategy that's predicated on growth, mm. right? And Bob needs to realize that soon, or else Bob's gonna get 12 months down the track and still have this vision of, I want another 20 stores, but Bob's still spinning his wheels because he's only getting two and a half customers from the ads that are going out yeah. through just Facebook. Right, but if you use Google, Snapchat, Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, so you know TikTok sort of just re read its head here in Australia right now. Who knows where that's moving at the moment? But there's so much opportunity to attack an omni-channel approach using multiple different channels and following people around yeah. everywhere, right? Because the again the singular 
channel is no longer the most advantageous, and, and that's just by sheer results yeah. from what we're seeing across the board. Yeah, amazing. Um, last, last couple of questions then. Um, I kind of on that note around putting your business across this ecosystem that we've got right now, this online ecosystem, such a fortunate time I think that we live in. Mm. Um, you've got your personal brand out there, but then you've got Klaxon that you're pushing. Mm -hmm. um, the people that were hiding behind their brands, um, they need to, you, you said this to me, Ryan, you need to be selling Ryan because there's an emotional connection and then mm. everything leads back to mm. the, the sales training organization. Um, how, how, do we, um, how do we do that how, quickly? Like, what can I do today to start yep. pushing my personal brand? Yeah, good. So um, start having a personal opinion, right? Yeah. It's a really big one. I was yeah. talking to you sort of off yeah, camera yeah. here. So I've started talking about things that, um, and it's been very intentional. Like if you look at me, I was very heavy into building personal brand pre Claxon, pre Campbell Media Group, mm -hmm. and I just sort of went into that business building mode and sort of pulled back and and yeah, we're about to do a lot more. Like for the people who haven't heard me before, it'll be like it was back in 2012, 13. They're like, "Fuck, dude, or I see you everywhere," because that's going to happen. Said there's levels, right? And you're going. You're there's going levels, all in. yeah. And yeah. now I'm, you know, I've been sitting down here on the ground basement floor almost. Um, for the last couple of years, um, and now you know I'm about to go to the penthouse. Yeah, you know, nice. and and how you can do that, I, I believe, firstly, is having a personal opinion and having a voice outside of your business. So creating that disconnect as well. Um, with, with that, then that that has to come with the not a disregard, but you need to have a thick skin for people to disagree with you, right? Because not everyone's going to agree with what you say, and that has to be okay. So yeah. uh, how do That's we right. how do we manage that? In layman's terms, you literally have to get over it, right? Yeah. And understand. This is why I go back to my acceptance strategy. If you can truly, and and I never really share my acceptance strategy the way I shared it because I sort of came out with the punchline. It's like a comedian telling you the punchline of the joke and then coming back to explain it doesn't have as great impact. But for me, like the acceptance strategy for me is a way of being able to think through something and. Like if someone goes, Brett, you're a fucking fraud, or you're this, or you're ugly, or you're fat head, or blah, 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 and I'm like, geez, I might have a bit of a fat head, oh my God, like, <laughs> it's cool. It, yeah. But my point there being is, how do you overcome that yeah. quickly, right? Yeah. And for me, is knowing that nothing else is gonna change. It is the way that it is unfolding. Mm -hmm. It happened, it's potentially gonna happen. Know that it's gonna happen, just be okay with, and know that it was supposed to happen. That's the other part yeah. of it, right? know that everything is that's about to happen is supposed to happen exactly the way it's supposed to happen because yeah. it is happening right mm. um and when you know that because normally i share the the strategy like most people would say everything happens for a reason you'd agree with that right mm. and that's what i'd call a, a sort of a surface level yeah. conversation like, everything happens for a reason it is what it is i mean cool but how much do you actually believe what you just said then yeah and when i say believe like how much do you actually feel of what you just said yeah because you're like, oh, my dog just got run over. Ah, it is what it is. Yeah. That's not fucking accepting enough for me to really reconcile that, yeah, yeah. right? So you need to get to a level of belief, whether it's that everything happened the way it was supposed to happen because it did, everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen because it is, whether it's that or it's a version of that for yourself, I feel everyone needs to have that level of acceptance strategy where they believe it at the level that someone believes in their high, their God. Yeah. There's people willing to kill themselves and blow themselves up for their God, for yeah. their religion. Yeah. That's belief, man. Like that's that's one thing that you could envy from the, from that <laughs> yeah. type of person, yeah. right? Is going, wow, the level of belief that you had in something. Yeah. Disregard what it was, but the level of belief is if us human, if us mortal humans, you know, were able to be able to create a belief pattern that that is so strong that when things happen to you that you can accept it and reconcile it. And I'm not saying, oh, my dog got run over, I'm not gonna go out and cry and be upset for the rest of the day. Yeah. But I'm also not gonna go and lay down for the next three weeks and be, why me, where's my dog, why is yeah, this? Because that's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's being able to accept it the way it was supposed to happen, mm. right? Because it did happen, you can't change it. Yep, you left the gate open. Well, you were supposed to leave the gate open. Guess why, because you did. Like, you were supposed to. You don't need to know the answer to it either because a lot of people are like, but I need to know what lesson it is. You don't need to know the lesson just now. Just know that there is a lesson one day. If it decides to show you, it'll it'll show you. Which is great right now during COVID, right? I I talk about my three-day wobble when we when all this hit. Um, I had a few, a few days in a row where I'm like, mm. I don't know what to do. Um, this is my first of three businesses. I only started out in business six years ago. I didn't go through the GFC as a business owner. I went through it as an employee. So yep. I was totally oblivious to it. 
Um, and I didn't know what to do. So what I did was reach out to our investors, um, mm -hmm. the Shark Tank guys, and they were just so, it is what it is. Um, just like ex accept it. This is what will happen from here. Yeah. Uh, so stop trying to figure out why it's happening. That, yeah. does, that doesn't matter. Nah. Draw a line in the sand. And then the word that, they, that all three of them said was strategy. What's your strategy to come out? Um, and I remember I spoke to Andrew Banks and he rang me and he said, um, do you have a strategy? And I said, yeah. I said, we're going to do this. He goes, ah, I don't care what it is. Do you have one and do you believe in it? And I said, yeah. He goes, all right, perfect. Have a good day. He didn't, he didn't care what it was. Mm. He just wanted to know that we had put something mm. in place to move forward. Um, and I think, obviously, that comes with resilience. I'm sure the next time something like this happens, if we go back into lockdown again, I won't have a three-day wobble. We're already prepared for it yep. um, as well. So it, it takes time, but the first yeah. thing to do is to have that. And, and I was, I guess, oh, lucky is probably not the word, but well, actually, to me, luck means, when anyone says lucky, you know, I, I look at it, I can't remember where I first heard this, but it's luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. Right, super powerful. So I was prepared mentally, and the opportunity arose mm. to rise above. So because I've been on this sort of wavelength for the last, you know, let's call it three years, really deeply trying to figure all this stuff out, um, and again, it's still a journey. But I was able to come to this, and, and I would have accepted our entire business going under. I wouldn't have let that be a reality in this like I would have fought hammer and tooth at every single yeah. thing that I possibly could to make it happen and I still feel like there's no way it would have went under even if I had to just go and get another loan or yeah. whatever there's ways to make it but I was totally at peace with that being a reality yeah right and call that recklessness or you know um, abandoning <laughs> care or mm. or whatever but it, it just makes things a lot a lot easier to be able to manage. It's quite because I know to I'm, do it, right? To, to just go, it's whatever happens is okay. Yeah, uh, but just know that everything that I'm going to do isn't in the right manner, and the, it's for the greater outcome and the greater good. And that's why I think it was so good for our team to be able to, um, like, our team were really nurtured. I don't think they realise how nurtured they were throughout this entire period. Mm. You know, um, yeah, we had to go work from home, and you know. For most people, it's like a holiday working from home, yeah. right? Um, but the the level of um, calm that you know myself and Daniel were able to you know provide the team um, was, I think, one of the main reasons why we've come out of this and you know things are back on track and everything's great and you know we're moving forward. Yeah. You know because there's some bosses out there that I was talking to people where they're like, oh, I just had to lay three people off. I'm like, mate, we're only fucking three days into yeah, this, yeah, dude. Yeah, what are you doing of... culling half your team right now? Like, yeah. hold a minute, have a bit of a breath, have a think through this. Let's look at some scenarios, you know, because that, people... That's the importance of having people like you, though, as a, as a mentor to, to say those things because as a naive... Um, not naive, but um, as, a, as a young business owner, only six years in, I, I was thinking that, um, and, and, you, and you panic. I didn't know there's government stimulus packages coming out. I didn't know JobKeeper was going to come out. So all you think about is kind of tying yeah. it up. So having that voice around you is really important, right? Yeah, look, I, I really think it is, and it's the, the it's um, for me, it's probably my most um, the thing I'm most proud about about myself is being able to to think my way through. And don't get me wrong, I have you know, days and situations where it's like, oh, fuck, what's going on? But I can quickly yeah. resolve and get out of there and go, okay, all right, Brett, how should you be thinking? What's the best way through this? And, yeah. and this is where I think one of the greatest skills anyone could learn is problem solving, man. Like mm. problem solving, like at school, right? My principal when I was at primary school, so it would have been like six, seven, eight, nine, um, I love solving problems so much that he actually created a class for me literally he was the teacher of it the principal where i got to pick a friend because no one else was really interested <laughs> i got to pick a friend to come and we'd do problems and we'd solve problems right so i whatever i took and learned from that it sort of started this cascade of figuring stuff out and and you know as a cabinet maker you back in the day i was given a a piece of paper, an A4 piece of paper with a square boxes drawn on it going, this is what the kitchen looks like, right? The, the pantry's in the corner and here's the dishwasher, here's the fridge. Go and map out everything and build it from nothing. Yeah, right. So when you, when you teach yourself and train yourself how to think through certain problems, 
it becomes quite fun. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I'm sure it's not for everyone, but you know, it's it's such a, I think a skill. <coughs> it can be taught. It can be taught. Um, but I think there's an innate structure around it. But it it can be taught where um, the more uh, or the easier it is for you to start thinking and working out problems, the more you're going to get in every area of your life. Your yeah. relationship's going to be better because you're going to be able to work through the blues that you have with your partner. Yeah. Right? It's like, fuck, why'd she say that when I said this? Or why did I say that when she said that? And I'll think it through and I'll be like, oh, God, what a jerk I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, babe, baby, can I talk to you for a minute? If she says no, I'll go, cool. <laughs> and not like, but I'm here to apologize. Yeah. Why are you, you know, yeah, yeah. it's, um, everything's got to have intent behind it. But you'll quickly be able to get through any little setbacks. Yeah. Too many people are living a life right now with shit that happened weeks and months and years ago that mm. they're still holding on to, yeah. and they're not getting the, the fulfillment out of a relationship or their business because they're still holding on to something. Yeah, which diminishes creative thinking as well. So, that, well, one thing that I it had does. training on was decision making. Like I was a poor decision maker. Yep. I'm a uh, a C for, for in, in this profile uh, yeah. and I sit on the fence. Uh, so you'd go to a restaurant then and you'd look at the menu horrible. back to front. Alicia, my wife, hates it. Yeah. Hates it. Just, can you just choose something? Yeah, I'd, ch I'd choose for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, dude, this is taking way too long. She, she often does. Yeah. And so I had to, I actually had training on how to make yeah. decisions quicker and, and going through the, the five stages of human decision to yeah. truly understand, okay, I, I've, I've done enough now to mitigate risk. Yeah. Trust my own judgment that 80% of the yeah. time I'm I'm right. And that's what it is, man. It's yeah. that. Like, you're never going to get the right decision always. Well, the right decision is the right decision because you made the decision. Yeah. Right? But my my thing there is, because people go, how do you order so fast? I'm like, well, before I sat down, I'm like, do I feel like pork, beef, yeah. lamb, or chicken right now? I'll go beef. Cool. Straight to the beef menu. Yeah, Not even just eliminate all now, of that. Now, in saying that, there is a risk to reward ratio. 20%, 30% of the yeah. time, I'll order something and I'll go, oh shit, that yeah. lamb ribs and lamb ribs encrusted right. with yeah, this yeah. or that. I'm like, I should have went with that. Yeah. But majority of the time, um, yeah. it, and it's a real thing, it's called decision fatigue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Having to make too many decisions can fatigue your mind. Yeah. And it becomes exhausting. Like the days where I'll get home and I'm like, Whew, I'm pretty exhausted is mm. when I've had to make heaps of decisions. It yeah. doesn't mean you were doing heaps of things. Yeah. Your mental capacity to be able to digest and yeah. figure things out. And, and again, it's a strategy. There's a strategy yeah. on how to make decisions. There's a strategy on how to work through things. Yeah. There's a strategy on how to build your business. A strategy on how to make a sales call, right? Everything can be broken down. Everything's a strategy. There's the headline for this podcast, um, mate. Thank there it you is. So, so much. Um, awesome. How can we connect with you? Where can we find you? Mate, just online. You can uh, go to brettcampbell.com.au. So it's Brett with two Ts. Um, it's not Brett or Brad. Or <laughs> you only go get a <laughs> coffee. I get Warren. Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. I get yeah. Brett a lot. I think it's my key, the Kiwi accent in me comes out. But brettcampbell.com.au. You can basically link to everything that I do and, and have from there. So. Amazing, mate. I know there was lots of nuggets of gold in there. I've made notes myself. I've cool. made more notes than actually asked the questions that I had planned to even talk good, about, which is a great time. So, yeah. <laughs> mate, thank you. Thanks, Appreciate brother. it.